Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to today's session. Um, we put the link in the Slack channel for uh, the tutorial, but if you didn't find it, it's just here. Um, so that contains the website with the instructions for the exercises we'll be going through today. Um, if you haven't already set up your environments, um, there is a sort of pre-workshop uh, setup instruction. Um, definitely take a look at that. Um, but we'll start out today with sort of a short lecture, just introducing um, Napari um, as the project, um, but then also some of the, the key components as well. Um, before getting started, uh, Draga and I will introduce ourselves. Um, so I'm Kevin. I'm a uh, postdoc at the ETH Zurich, um, where I develop uh, software for image processing. Um, also, I am a core developer of Napari, which is the tool we'll be using today. Hi, I'm Draga. I'm also a co-developer on Napari, uh, and I'm a PhD student uh, in Melbourne, Australia, and I'm working on cell tracking stuff, uh, hence my frequent usage of Napari. So, yeah. Um, just to get to know folks a little bit, um, it would be great just to maybe a show of hands for if any of these things resonate with you. Um, so I am a data scientist. Some data scientists. Um, how about a biologist? Awesome, okay, also into biology. Um, how about uh, I do sort of uh, like geospatial uh, geology stuff, awesome. Some other type of engineering, physics, cool. Um, excited to be at SciPy. Yeah. Yeah. All, right. All right, cool, well, uh, that's great. So Napari, uh, so a lot of the examples and sort of the discussion we'll have today um, will be sort of with applications with an eye towards biology, because um, Draga and I both do a lot of bioimage analysis, um, but we really hope that Napari can be a great tool for people doing image processing in all sorts of domains. Um, so we'd love to hear questions or comments from you um, about things that uh, you would like to be able to do with Napari that maybe you're not sure if you can, um, or if things aren't clear because we're using um, jargon from biology. Um, so please feel free to stop us at any point. Um, and so today, as I mentioned, uh, the, the rough structure will be, um, we'll give an introduction to the project, um, to the Napari viewer, um, and then we'll have a series of hands-on exercises in which we'll ask you to pair up um, and then work through the notebooks and we'll sort of walk around and uh, make sure folks are, are getting along just fine. Um, and then you can expect today um, to do a bit of interactive analysis, combining Napari with Jupyter Notebooks. Um, segmenting nuclei, and we'll learn what nuclei are <laughs> uh, in a moment, uh, using a plugin, um, and then also Draga will be helping you make your first uh, Napari plugin. So first, a bit about the project. Um, the motivation for us um, is we really wanted to have, um, in Python, um, sort of a fast uh, tool that allowed us to interactively visualize our images and data sets while we're doing the image processing. Um, because there's so many great tools, as I'm sure you're aware, because you're here at SciPy, um, in the scientific Python ecosystem, um, we wanted to make sure that uh, we could seamlessly interact with those tools um, and, and integrate them into our workflows. Um, we wanted to be able to support large data. Um, so arbitrary large in this case just means uh, too large for memory um, and possibly remote data. So if you have the data in, in a bucket in the cloud somewhere, we want to be able to access it, interact with it, analyze it. Um, because we're aware that lots of folks want to do lots of different things, uh, we want to make sure that Napari is extensible and customizable. Um, so really, we think of it as it's sort of this core viewer tool um, so that when you're developing your analysis, you don't have to reinvent the wheel in terms of making sort of the core visualization components. You can focus on bringing the great analysis you do um, and share it with the community. Um, and speaking of community, um, a, a sort of a core value of the project is we want it to be an inclusive, community-driven project. Um, and this is really only possible because we're building on top of the shoulders of many great scientific Python libraries like VizPy, um, which we're using for the rendering and visualization, uh, NumPy and Dask, which support the arrays, um, Zar, which is some a common format that's used for uh, on-disk storage, um, and the Qt library, which provides a lot of the GUI components. Um, so next, we'll go through a few different ways that people interact with Napari. Um, so one way um, is by loading images in and then using the plugins to actually do your analysis or exploration in the GUI. Um, so this is an example of a plugin from Carson Stringer at Janilia, um, and she wrote a segmentation algorithm that allows uh, 
people to identify uh, the individual cells um, in microscopy images. Um, and so this is bringing a deep learning neural network into Napari. Um, she's created a nice user interface that allows users to choose their settings, choose models. Um, and the great thing about this is you can try a setting, see what the effect is, and then iterate. Um, another mode, and this is more of what we'll be doing today, um, is what I like to call um, interactive analysis. Um, this is where you sort of side by side are doing something um, in an interactive computing environment, like a Jupyter notebook, seeing what the result is in the viewer, going back, making a change. Um, and I find that's a really nice way to A, gain some intuition for how the different operations we apply to the data affect the data, um, but also as a way to sort of do uh, human in the loop quality control to make sure the things you're doing are doing the things that uh, you think they are. Um, so this is just kind of a small toy example, but you can fire up a notebook and we'll do this uh, in a few moments here together. Um, and you can load in your images. Uh, so you can load in your images uh, and then pass them to the viewer. Um, and that allows you to then see the image in the viewer, which is the, the window on the right. On the right for you as well. Yeah. Um, and the cool thing is you can then take those images, um, and in this case we're using scikit image um, to blur the image a little bit with a Gaussian filter, um, and then you can add that image to the viewer as well as, as a new layer. Um, so just like uh, tools like Photoshop and Illustrator, um, we allow you to layer your visualizations, um, so that allows you to customize how they're viewed, um, and then also turn them on and off. Um, so in this case we put our blurred image on top of our original image, and this would allow you to, for example, go back and forth and see, see what changed. Um, and another usage mode, um, and this is really uh, sort of maybe more of an advanced application, um, but because Napari is written in Python, um, you can write scripts um, that bring together lots of different tools. Um, so this is an example um, from Juan Nunez Iglesias, uh, where he's doing some self-supervised denoising of some images. And so this is an iterative process where the algorithm learns how to remove the noise from the image, um, and he's able to do the training of the algorithm. Um, you can see that he's plotting the loss or sort of how well the algorithm is currently doing. Um, and then you get a preview of what, what the images uh, currently would look like using the current settings. Um, and so the idea here is uh, by virtue of being written in Python, Napari can act as sort of this hub that allows you to orchestrate and bring together a lot of different tools. So now a bit of an introduction into the viewer itself. Um, so the viewer is sort of one of the main sort of top level uh, concepts. Uh, this is the sort of the graphical user interface window. This is where you'll actually view the images, um, interact with them. Uh, there's a few different components to this window. Um, so the first is the canvas. And so this is where actually all the visuals are rendered. Um, and so this is where you see your images or if you have different types of annotations like points or shapes, this is where they show up. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a concept called layers. And so typically each data set will get its own layer. Um, and the layer list is where you can see and, and select how those are currently being viewed. Um, so this would, for example, allow you, if you click the eye icon, uh, turn a layer on and off. You can reorder um, how, they're, how they're visualizing the canvas. Um, and then each layer has a set of controls that allows you to choose how it's rendered. So this current layer that's selected is an image. Um, and You'll be able to uh, change parameters such as the opacity, so how see-through that image is. Um, you can change the contrast limits, so that affects how sort of the color is applied to the image, so the visualization. Um, you can affect how that image is blended with, with the adjacent layers, so the layers on top and below it. Um, and then as well as you can change the interpolation, um, so how the image is, is actually rendered. Um, we mentioned before that we aim to be multi-dimensional. Um, so Oftentimes your images might have three spatial dimensions, but you might have other aspects as well, such as maybe you've acquired Im uh, different wavelengths. Um, so that could be a fourth dimension, different time points, that might be a fifth dimension. And so for the dimensions, we, you know, we can only display two or three dimensions in the viewer. Um, and so if you, for all the dimensions that aren't currently being displayed, a slider is generated at the bottom and that allows you to choose which slice or which time point or which channel you're currently viewing. Um, you can also add and remove layers. Um, so if you, you've added a visual, you don't want to use it anymore. Um, we have a bunch of controls for doing that. Um, you can actually control how things are displayed. So you can switch between two-dimensional and three-dimensional rendering. Um, you can select which dimensions are currently being rendered. And you would do that down in the lower left-hand corner in the canvas controls. 
Um, and finally, we have a status bar, which allows you to, uh, when you use your mouse in the canvas, inspect what is underneath it. So for example, in an image, you would know what the current intensity value is for the pixel that you're mousing over. Um, if you're using polygons, you would be able to see what shape you're selecting, uh, things like that. Um, and so we have many different layer types. Um, and the way that we think of this is uh, the layers are a particular way to visualize a set of data. Uh, so one of the layers types that we have um, are image layers. And so this is probably our most commonly used layer. Um, so this is when you have some sort of intensity data. Maybe it's images from a satellite. It could be images from a microscope. Um, these can be multidimensional. So again, you can have two or three spatial dimensions, um, but then you can also have other dimensions added on to, that might represent um, color or time, uh, different positions in a well plate, things like that. Um, we also allow for dynamic loading and processing um, from disks. So this is great when you have really large data. Um, so the jargon here is lazy loading. Um, but the idea is that um, you can just load the piece of the data set that you're currently viewing um, with, with, some, with some constraints. And we, we can talk more about that later. Um, but this is an example from Tali Lambert, um, where they're loading in some images from a microscope. And as they're being loaded, doing a little bit of pre-processing, well, it's actually quite a lot of pre-processing. Um, <laughs> it's uh, deconvolving the image and doing the de-skewing, um, which is basically trying to undo some of the, the aberrations that are introduced by the imaging system. I'm doing that online as you load in a different slice. Um, we also allow rendering, three-dimensional rendering um, that, that allows you to selectively render planes. So for example, uh, maybe if you've looked at a three-dimensional data set, but you, what you want to see is actually in the middle. Um, this allows you to sort of slice through or cut away different parts of the image and just see the parts that you're interested in. Uh, a highly related layer um, is what we call the labels layer. Um, and so this is a, a special type of image um, that's most commonly used uh, in the context of segmentation. Um, so for example, um, if you were looking at this image of coins and you wanted to identify each individual coin, um, the pixel values here each have um, an, an integer value that denotes which uh, instance or class that pixel is a part of. So for example, all of these sort of light purple ones on the left-hand side all would have the same value, and that tells us that's one uh, individual coin. And similarly, the other coins would each have their own integer value. And then, of course, we can view these in three dimensions or multi multi multiple dimensions. And so this is uh, some data from, I believe it's the Allen Cell Brain Atlas. This is a mouse brain, um, and the different regions are annotated by different colors. Another type of layer is the points layer. Um, so this is great when you're identifying objects. Um, so in biology, um, this is most commonly used for techniques like single molecule localization or single molecule fish, where you want to identify where individual molecules are in your image. Um, in ast astronomy, this is often used to, for example, find different stars um, or, or show, show the position of different stars. Um, and we allow the user to, to sort of richly color them based on different properties. So for example, what kind of star it is or the size, things like that. We also have a layer for de just depicting vector data. Um, so this is great for showing, um, for example, orientations of fields. Um, so if you do electromagnetism, that's a great way to show the different field lines. Um, <laughs> this is showing the orientation of different receptors on viral particles. Um, people often use this as well um, in mechanics. So if you want to show a stress field or a strain field, this is a great way to show that. Um, this is sort of a specialized layer, but it's the layer that we call the tracks layer. Um, and so this is really useful when you are tracking particles or objects over time, um, because it adds a little tail onto the particle that becomes you know, lighter and lighter, uh, showing where the position, the position of that particle most recently in time. So it sort of just shows you where the history of where it's been um, and makes it a lot easier to see uh, sort of the, the way that the different particles are moving together. And uh, this was contributed by uh, one of their community members, Alan Lowe at UCL and, and the Turing Institute in London. Um, and then they've actually built out a full application that they call Arboretum for tracking cells over time. So these are um, both, uh, some, this is a really cool example, I think, because this is, this is something that a community member needed. Uh, they built it, they contributed it back to the project, which means that other folks can, can now take advantage of it as well.
uh, if you do work with surfaces, um, so for example, this is um, data from uh, fMRI. So this is sort of a, a proxy for brain activity. Um, and what it can do is it allows you to uh, both define the surface as a polygon mesh, um, but then also color it based on some measured value. And these can be done both statically, um, but this is also, for example, a time series in, in 3D. Um, and the final layer is what we call the shapes layer, and this is for polygon annotations. Um, so this is really useful, um, again, sort of a biology example, sorry, um, but if you have regions of interest in, in, um, in maybe like a large slide where you've identified the boundaries of tumor, um, this is a great way to sort of make that annotation, but also store it and share it with your collaborators. Um, hopefully you've already done this, <laughs> uh, but uh, you, we, you can install Napari in two different ways. Um, one is via PIP and the other is via Conda. So these are kind of the two major uh, ways that packages are distributed in Python. Um, if you do have issues with installation, um, feel free to, uh, well, of course, we'll, we'll get you sorted today. Um, but in the future, feel free to uh, reach out to us and we're, we're totally happy to help. Um, and so what we've showed so far are sort of the core uh, functionalities of Napari itself, um, but of course many of you are likely interested in extending it and doing something custom for your own work. Um, and so one of the ways you can do that is via our plugin system. Um, and so the, our motivation here is uh, we want users to be able to customize and extend Napari without needing to actually modify sort of the core code. Um, but importantly, we also want these components to be shareable by the community um, so people don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. Um, if you create, for example, a create segmentation algorithm, we want your colleagues to also be able to use that segmentation algorithm if you uh, wish to share with them. Um, some example use cases of why people in the past have created plugins. Um, so one is, for example, uh, most fields have their custom file format. Um, and so this is a great way to add support for loading those data. Um, another is um, if you want to create or provide a graphical user interface for some analysis code um, that you've developed. Um, for people who want to use plugins, um, or if you want to advertise the existence of your plugin, um, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative has been working on a project called the Napari Hub, um, which aims to be a centralized site um, to discover um, and explore uh, Napari plugins. Um, the URL is here, so it's napari-hub.org. Um, the idea here is you can, if you have, for example, a topic um, or a sort of an operation you want to be able to apply for your to your data, uh, you can search for it and it will show you um, sort of the existing plugins um, that do that and um, also some information about how you install it um, kind of uh, so how recently it's been modified so that kind of helps you know is this being actively developed um, what are sort of the other dependencies or requirements um, that you need to mind in order to be able to use it with your, with your analysis um, and so i use this both um, to find uh, plugins to help me do my work um, but then also when I'm thinking of making a new tool, this is always the first place I go to see, has somebody already done this? Um, so I can maybe just contribute to their work rather than creating yet another, you know, something, something or another. Um, for installing plugins, we do, so you can install them via the command line, but we also have a built-in plugin installer. Um, so that can be accessed via the plugin menu. Um, and so that allows you to search um, and then install uh, plugins of interest. Um, just to give you a sense for um, some of the plugins that already exist, we'll just go through a few examples. Um, the idea here is not so much to show you how to use these plugins, um, but uh, to make you aware that they exist, but also kind of uh, maybe provide some in inspiration for why or uh, what types of plugins you might want to make um, with your own work. Um, so this first one is the PyClus Pronto Assistant from Robert Haza in Dresden. Um, and this is a plugin that provides GPU accelerated um, sort of common image processing operations um, like uh, filtering, uh, counting, uh, measuring. Um, this is a great way to uh, sort of create performant image processing pipelines. Um, and the cool thing is it's written in OpenCL, so it's cross platform, so you can do it on CPU and you can do it on GPUs. Um, and then also he's written interoperability tools um, that allow you to export uh, scripts that can also be used. Um, in Fiji, which is a really popular um, image processing toolbox um, used in, uh, in bioimage analysis. Um, this is one that we'll be using today. Um, it's called Stardust. 
Um, and so this is an object detection algorithm that's really useful for uh, segmenting nuclei um, from microscopy images. Um, and CellFinder is another example of a segmentation algorithm. Um, this one's really focused on large images. Um, so Adam Tyson, who developed this, uh, would take images of whole mouse brains um, and then find all the individual neurons of interest um, within the brain. Um, this is another useful one uh, called Napari Animation from Guillaume Witz and Bern and Alistair Burt uh, and Nick Safranyev. Um, and this allows you to create animations um, from, from your images um, by just defining keyframes. So you can go to sort of interesting parts of your image, um, and it'll automatically create a video that interpolates between all those different uh, places um, that creates these nice smooth renderings. Um, and I, I find this to be a really nice way to, to share results with, with my collaborators, uh, generate movies for publications, um, things of that sort. Um, we'll be going through this today, um, but we to, to make uh, creating plugins easier, um, we've created what's called a cookie cutter, um, which is basically a template that sets up the project for you. So you can only uh, focus on creating the small bits, which are uh, generally your analysis code um, or your code to load load, uh, load the data. Um, and um, Drago will be giving a nice, nice tutorial on that later today. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, Napari is a community-driven project with contributions from a lot of folks. Um, the slide's a bit old. It's, it's, well, it, I guess it's still more than 80, but it's, it's like way, way more, more than 100 now, which is great. Um, and we have, uh, so sort of uh, leading the ship, uh, Juan Nunez Iglesias, Loa Ferrier, Nick Safranyev, and Tali Lambert are on the steering council. Uh, Kira Evans provided a lot of the really early contributions that got Napari off the ground. Um, and then we have sort of bold here, a pretty vibrant uh, core development team. Um, and we also uh, have, have good contributions from many, many more community members. Um, and if you want to reach out after the tutorial, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we love contributions of all shapes and sizes. Um, you know, we, we find it really helpful, if you, even if you just drop an issue telling us something that isn't working or something that you wish Napari could do. Um, we also, of course, accept code contributions. Um, Draga and I will be uh, having a sprint on, or uh, hosting one of the sprints on this weekend, um, so at the end of the SciPy. Um, and we would be more than happy to uh, so, of course, yeah, we, we would be happy to help you make your first pull request. Um, but also, if you just have something you want to try to do in Napari, we're happy to use that time for that as well. Um, so please, yeah, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, and um, yeah, great to see you. Uh, oh, last thing I wanted to mention is we do have community meetings. Um, and these are really meetings where folks come by and show what they're working on. Um, or maybe they have a question or maybe a complaint. Um, that's fine, too, um, that they want to communicate to the rest of the community. Um, and so these are... Uh, at these times here, we tried to spread it out so um, they can be uh, accessible for people at all different time zones. Um, so usually there's two meetings. Two of these three meetings would be probably more or less during the workday for you. Um, so hopefully we, we can see you there. And um, we'll put links to all this stuff in, in, the, in the Slack channel. Um, so in conclusion, um, Napari is a Python-based viewer for visualizing, annotating, and analyzing. Uh, n-dimensional images, um, and it can be used in both an interactive and scripted manner. Um, and we can use plugins to extend the functionality and provide GUIs uh, for analysis workflows. Um, today, what we'll be doing is uh, performing some interactive analysis uh, in, in a Jupyter notebook. Um, we'll be using one of the plugins to uh, called Stardust to segment nuclei, um, and also you will make your first um, Napari plugin. So are there any questions or comments before we sort of start jumping into the hands-on parts. Just out of curiosity, how many folks have either used Napari or heard of it before coming? Okay, awesome, cool mix. Um, okay, so this is not my computer, um, so I hope this part works. Um, so basically, uh, the way the way that sort of the hands-on portion is structured, uh, we will have a part where we sort of show um, some of the key concepts that you'll be doing. And during that, don't worry about following along in terms of like typing on your computer. Um, just uh, You can just watch us, listen, ask questions. 
Um, and then you'll have an opportunity to sort of, um, in a self-directed manner with, with our assistants, um, work through those notebooks and then we'll, we'll sort of go around. Um, we would ask that you uh, pair up if you're comfortable. Um, we find that it helps to kind of have a buddy to, to go through this journey. Um, and so uh, to get started, let's see here. That's you. Um, so this is just a demo notebook. Um, so actually, let me start from the beginning here, just a full value experience. Okay. All right, I'm going to make this bigger. So shout out to Lucy over here. Uh, she saved us. None of our laptops were working uh, with this projector. Um, so thanks to her, uh, we have projection. Um, so this is a terminal um, and we have already, actually, let's, let's actually start from the, from the top of the beginning. So as suggested in the um, tutorial instructions, uh, Lucy has set up her laptop with uh, Conda. Um, so this is a way to manage your environments um, in Python. Um, and we like using environments because it allows you to um, sort of keep the packages that you're using for a given project together, um, which helps reduce uh, sort of dependency conflicts, um, but also helps you when you go back to run that analysis some months later to make sure that it works uh, more or less <laughs> in the same way. Um, and so here we will use Conda and then the command is activate, which is will allow us to choose, select one of our environments. And this one is called Napari tutorial. If you follow, this is how it was called in the, in the instructions. And when that works successfully, um, in parentheses, you should see the name of the environment that you've just entered. Um, and so there's this command uh, in Unix and Linux, which PWD, which gives you your current directory. So currently we are in the repository um, that, that you may have downloaded already, um, containing all of the workshop materials. Um, and what we'll do, we're gonna do is we're gonna launch from this directory, uh, the Jupyter Notebook. Um, and all of this stuff is, is totally documented in the tutorial instructions, just kind of want to show it to you um, uh, live. And uh, again, please feel free to stop me if you have any questions or something isn't working. So, oh, sorry, I didn't even explain it all what I just did. Um, so, <laughs> Let's start over, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so the way I like to launch uh, the Jupyter Notebook is I say python-m, which says we're gonna use a module. And then the, the notebook is, is the name of the module. So we say python-m notebook. And what this should do um, is it will launch the Jupyter Notebook in your web browser. So this will just open in your default web browser, in this case, Chrome. Um, and it should open up to this homepage um, which is, it might look familiar. This is, it's kind of like a file browser. So this shows you uh, from the directory that you launched from. So in this case, this is the Napari uh, intro tutorial. Uh, and we will go into the notebooks directory by clicking the link. And then we'll select a notebook. Um, I just added a quick notebook here um, just to do this, this demo part, um, but you'll start with part zero, uh, which is the viewer uh, intro. And so if you click on the notebook, it will launch. Um, and we will get started. So this first thing, so in Python, when you want to use a module or a library, uh, we have to import it. So we say import Napari. Um, and then next command that we'll do, uh, it's napari.viewer. And what this does is it launches the viewer. Um, so this is the actual graphical user interface and returns this viewer object, which is your Python representation of the viewer. And this is how you can interact via your script or the command line with with the viewer that you see. Um, so if the first time you launch, so that launched fairly quickly. Um, the first time you launch Napari, it does take a bit more time because it has to build some stuff. That's normal, uh, just be patient. <laughs> um, and so you should see this viewer window. Uh, as you see, we just launched the viewer with no arguments. Um, so this is sort of just the default window. No data has been loaded. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use scikit image to download and load some images. And so this, we're going to use the imread function. Yeah, I think it's a little bigger actually. Yeah. The imread function from scikit image, and we're going to download the image from this, this URL. Oh, 
OK? And so uh, what I snuck in at the bottom here is a little print statement that tells us something about the image that we just downloaded. Um, so typically um, in Python, uh, images are stored as some sort of array. Um, in this case, it's a NumPy array. Um, and this array has shape 60 by 256 by 256. Um, and so what that means is that this is a three-dimensional image, which has 60 Z slices and in at the X, Y plane is 256 by 256. Um, we can add that image to our viewer um, using this viewer. So again, we have this viewer object, which this is sort of our representation of the viewer in our notebook. Um, and we can add an image to it using the dot add underscore image method um, and passing it the, the, the image that we just had or downloaded. Um, and when you go to the viewer, what you should see, what we see now is uh, the image loaded. Um, and so, as I mentioned, an image is an array. Um, and if we zoom in really far, um, what we see is at each pixel, it's a slightly different brightness. And so what the viewer is doing is it's taking the value of the array and mapping it to a color. Um, so in this case, the, the, the values of the array can go from 0 to 1. Uh, 1 is the brightest, 0 is the darkest. Um, and this is where you have to know a little bit about how the image was generated or acquired. Um, but that number generally tells us um, how bright the image is or how much of that quantity that we're measuring exists in that position. Um, and so in this case, this is an image of nuclei and cells. Um, and so this tells us, sort of, roughly speaking, how much DNA is in, is in that location. Um, and so as we mentioned just a moment ago, um, this is actually a three-dimensional image. And as you can see, we're viewing in two dimensions. Um, and so what Napari did is created a, a slider down here that allows us to slice through that, that third dimension, or in this case, the z-axis. So for example, this is down here. You see this is the 30th slice. We can move to the right, which increases the slice number. Now we're looking at the 37th slice. Um, and uh, so if you aren't doing bioimage analysis regularly, you might wonder, what are these blobs? <laughs> um, and so this is a cartoon of a cell. Um, you might recognize this from a, uh, like a high school biology textbook. Um, and what we're looking at are the nuclei, which is this sort of purplish region here. Um, and those are the, uh, where the DNA is stored in the cell. So all of your cells have a copy of your genome. Um, and this is where your DNA, and that's where it lives. Um, the next image we look at will be the cell membrane, which is the outside of the cell. And this gives us the sort of the extent or the shape of the cell. Um, and so the viewer, um, and the, uh, it, from the viewer, we're actually able to, the viewer object, we're able to interact with the items that we, we were currently displaying. Um, and so in viewer.layers, this is the list of the layers that are currently being displayed. And so if we go here, this is the layer list. Um, and so when you say viewer.layers, it's going to show you everything that's in this list. And um, then we can access those items by their name. And so this one is called nuclei. And so this will give us the Python representation of this image, this image layer. Um, and then what you'll see in the tutorial is we can use that object or Python representation to change the way that we're, we're currently viewing it. Um, but what I wanted to show you here is you can access the data. So this is the actual underlying image that's being displayed by the data uh, uh, parameter. And you can say, shape just like we did before. So it's a NumPy array um, and it gives us the shape of the image. Um, and then you can also inspect the data itself. So these are the actual values at each pixel in the array. Um, the last thing I, could, I wanted to show you is how you can overlay multiple uh, images at once. And this, I hope, sort of illustrates why layers are useful. Um, so we're going to load another image. Um, as I mentioned, this is an image of the membranes. Um, so if we go back to our cartoon, uh, this is the outer boundary of the cell. Um, and we can, just like before, we can add the image using viewer.addImage uh, to, to the viewer. Um, so what you might notice here uh, is we no longer see the nuclei um, because these images are on top of each other. 
So if you use the little I button here, you can toggle the visibility of a given layer. So in this case, it's the membranes layer. We can turn it off when we see it below. But oftentimes what you want to do is you actually want to see both things at once. Um, and so the way you can do that is when you select the layer on the layer list, uh, the layer controls here are updated uh, for that given layer, and you can change some of the rendering parameters. So in this case, because what we want to do is we want to see through um, this top layer so we can see the nuclei underneath, uh, we just want to reduce the opacity a little bit. Um, so you should, should see the, the layer below um, come into view. And then the other aspect is uh, now it's, it's still like, because we've seen the images before, we can, uh, as humans, we can discriminate between sort of this nuclei and these cell boundaries, you know, they're different things, um, but it can also be helpful to use color uh, to separate these items. Um, so you can change the color map. Um, and so again, uh, when we zoom in, uh, each pixel has a value um, and the color map is uh, what transforms that pixel value. So this number between zero and one into a color. Um, so this is a gray color map. So what that means is uh, zero pixels. So the lowest pixels are black um, and uh, pixels that have a value of one would have a, a color of white, um, but we can choose a different color map. So for example, uh, we can use this one called magma um, for the membranes. And so what this color map does, you can see in this little bar here. So this is from lo the lowest value to the highest value. Um, so it should make something that's sort of purplish black for the low values and something that's uh, sort of yellow white for the, uh, for the high values. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to show you about when you're sort of overlaying and changing the rendering parameters uh, or explain rather are the contrast limits. Um, so like I mentioned, uh, the color map uh, transforms these numeric values in the pixels to colors. And by default, uh, zero is gonna be set as the lowest value um, and one will be set as the highest value. And so zero in this case would, would map to this sort of purple and then one would map to the yellow. But sometimes our data doesn't actually span the full range. Right. So a lot of times, especially in, in, in microscopy, um, most of your data will lie kind of in the, in the bottom, like 50% of that range. Um, so what we want to do is we want to compress the coloring range just to match that. And that's what the contrast limits are for. Um, and so if you right click on the contrast limit slider, you can select which value on the left is going to be the darkest value and which value on the right is going to be the lightest value. Um, so if we slide it forward, what you'll see is a lot of these pixels that had color before are now becoming darker because we're saying we're moving up sort of that dark point. And similarly, if you shift the right uh, slider over, you change the brightness. So this is now 0 0.65 is now sort of the, the, going to be mapped to the brightest color. Um, and so you can play with that to sort of get a visualization that allows you to observe all the features that you're interested in. Um, so that was sort of a quick overview of some of the concepts in the viewer. Um, and in this next tutorial, or in this first tutorial, you're actually gonna do a lot of these things yourself. Um, and so I would encourage you to uh, fire up your terminal, um, and launch your notebook. Um, did anybody have trouble installing or just hasn't had time to install yet? Great, okay, we'll come to you. Anybody else? Uh, either way, both. Well, so. Okay, happy to come by. Um, and so the first tutorial, so if you go to the website that we had mentioned earlier, the tutorial sort of order is here under the instructions. Um, so currently we are doing the uh, part zero, which is just the introduction to the viewer. So that's gonna rehash a lot of the concepts that we just went over. I encourage you to explore and play. Um, we tried to give plenty of time for, these for the, the different exercises, so don't feel rushed. Um, and yeah, maybe just raise your hand if you have questions, but I think the two of you have already flagged the issues, so we'll, we'll come by. Okay, so we will um, continue with the next part of the tutorial, the last part of the tutorial. Um, and I'm cheating here uh, by loading up the uh, solution notebook, uh, which you are all, of course, welcome to do. Um, but what I wanted to show you is uh, where we would have ended up, right? So when we initially loaded in the image uh, and the spots, 
we kind of were just seeing uh, this. So you have uh, the nuclei in the background and then all these spots are kind of hanging around um, the nuclei. These spots, by the way, are RNA molecules. Um, we don't, we're not sure what they're doing there, uh, but if a biologist knows, they're welcome to, <laughs> to you know, share with the class. Um, but the goal was, okay, we know these, we, you know, we can physically see these spots are there, but how can we tell the computer to find these spots? And then, you know, once they found them, maybe we can do some analysis on them. And so the first step was implementing a Gaussian fil a high pass filter, sorry. Uh, and that is what the uh, Gaussian high pass looks like. And once you add that filtered image, once you fill, you know, run the filter on the image data, and then add it, you just see this, right? So if I turn off um, the spots in the nuclei, just so we can see a bit more clearly, you can see that it's done um, some thresholding and compared to the original spots, believe it or not, it's actually less noisy. Yeah, so you can see there's sort of like a little bit of noise in there. Uh, once you get you know, down to the contrast limits, and this filter uh, should hopefully uh, you know, get rid of them. And once you've got that filtered image, the next step was to uh, write the detect spots function, uh, which you know, takes in these parameters uh, and then does some computation and returns the coordinates of the points and the sizes of the points. And so once you've, once you've run this detect spots function on your filtered image, um, which we do down here. Um, you can you, you have a points layer, so we know this is a points layer. It's got that little uh, icon there, uh, and when we click on it, you can see you can change the face color of the points and the edge color and so on. But essentially, what we're looking at is that the points are more or less lined up with the right spots in the image, um, which they are. So. Now that we've got this function, uh, we can use it anywhere in this notebook, or we could put it in a script and like share it with our friends. Um, but ideally, we would share it more broadly with the world, right? Uh, and that's where the, the, the plugins come in. So I'm going to go through a um, kind of dry, potentially lecture. I'll try not to make it dry, but maybe it will be a bit dry. Lecture on how you turn just this like Python code living somewhere in a notebook, how you hook that up to Napari and kind of tell Napari, hey, this is code that should be a plugin and you should discover this code. Um, and yeah, so I'll tell you how to hook up all that machinery and I'll tell you how to turn just a plain Python function into a widget, right? Into something that uh, maybe like you saw with the Stardust has buttons and then sliders and stuff like that. Um, and then when it seems like all hope is lost and there's a lot to remember, I'll introduce the cookie cutter template uh, and that will hopefully brighten your day because you'll realize you don't have to remember any of this. It's just helpful to know. Um, but uh, yeah, so the cookie cutter template does kind of abstract all of this away from you. So you don't really need to be a Python packaging expert or anything like that to make a plugin, but it's useful to know the, the, the background. Uh, and so uh, let's, Let's go ahead and do that. Uh, so I think I said pretty much all of this, and anyway, I'll say it again. But yeah, so Napari has different types of plugins. Uh, each plugin can do many things, but broadly, we have readers that read custom data formats into Napari layers. Um, so, you know, a common file format is TIFF. That one is read by the inbuilt reader, but not all formats are read by the inbuilt reader. So you can create your own custom one. There's writers that save Napari layers to file. Um, there's sample data that provides data that can be opened from the sample menu. And actually, we probably should have shown you this earlier, but um, if you go file, open sample, uh, there are a bunch of images that you can just open directly from the viewer without like installing anything additional. Um, and so it's really nice to have that there if you just want to quickly open up an image and you don't have something lying around. Uh, the open sample menu is there. And as you can see, the Stardust plugin actually provides its own sample images as well. So lots of the plugins now provide sample images. Um, and that's really useful as well, because without having used a plugin before, you may not know what kinds of images it's 
it runs on or what it's good for. And so plugins that provide samples um, are becoming more common. And then there's widgets, uh, which a widget is just like a little bit of GUI functionality. Uh, and usually these widgets provide GUI access to different analysis functions uh, and different analysis code that you can run without running code. <laughs> um, and then there's themes, which like change the Napari theme, like from light to dark or to pink or to blue or whatever. And I don't actually think we have a pink theme, um, which is a gross negligence on our part, but you know, whatever. Uh, and so today we're actually just going to focus on widgets because that's what we're going to be building. Uh, but as I'll show you in the cookie cutter later, there are like pre-built examples of readers and writers and everything. So you can go in and play with them without having to um, write your own from scratch. And so widgets are just Python functions, more or less. Um, there's actually three different ways to define Napari widgets, but in, 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 in its plainest form, it is just a Python function that you decorate with Magic Factory, uh, and then all of the GUI is built for you. So you don't have to worry about adding labels or adding text boxes or making buttons or anything like that. That's all done for you by Magic GUI. Um, and so I like to think of, when, when I'm building plugins, I like to think of the contract between me and Napari. Um, and so your function signatures are that contract. So if you give Napari a function that accepts correct parameters as defined in the contract um, and returns the right values, Napari will call that function for you at the appropriate time. Uh, and so what does that kind of look like? Let's say you have a plugin, and this is a real plugin, uh, called Affinder, and then you have Napari, right? These are two kind of like separate Python packages. But Affinder returns a function to Napari that can build a widget. And when the user goes to plugins and then clicks on the Affinder you know, button, that function is created. Uh, is that function is called, rather. Um, so Napari, in its code, will be like, oh, call the Affinder widget function. Uh, and that will just build the, the GUI for you. Now, how does it know what to put in the GUI? Uh, right, is the main question. Because I've said that your function signature is enough, so how does Napari turn things into GUI? Uh, and the way it does that is using type annotations of your function signature. Now, Python, many of you may know, but if you don't, this is the term, is not a strongly typed language. Uh, so what that means is that I can assign an integer, uh, and it is five, and its type is integer. Uh, but then I can just save a string into that same variable, uh, and then it changes type to a string, right? In most, I don't know what to say in most. In many languages, once you've defined the type of a variable, that's it. Like if it's an integer, it'll stay an integer for life and woe be upon you if you try to assign a string into it. But Python's not like that. Um, and so what Python has provided as a kind of like middle ground, if you do want type, typed things, um, are type annotations. And so Python won't enforce these. It's not going to yell at you if you uh, ignore a type annotation. Um, but for Napari, type annotations are super useful because if you have type annotated a function signature, we will take that type annotation and we'll build a GUI element for you. So for example, this is, this is a function signature. Uh, if you're not sure uh, what a function signature is, this is a function signature. It is the name of the function, which is string multiplier. It is the arguments to the function, which are input, stir, and multiplier in this case. And both of them have been type annotated. One is a string and one is an integer. And then it's the return value. And the return value, uh, can you see? Yeah. Uh, the return value is also a type string. So what this function signature tells me is that this function takes two parameters, one a string, one an integer, and returns a string. Uh, and all it does is it just multiplies that string uh, by the multiplier. So if I give it hello and five, 
uh, it prints hello five times. Um, so the, the type annotations are these bits after the colons. Um, and they just tell Python a guideline as to what you expect that parameter to be. So how do we turn that into a widget? We're gonna focus, like I said, specifically on magic GUI widgets. So you won't be building buttons, you won't be building labels or anything, that's done for you. Um, and both the parameters and the return value are meaningful to Napari in this case. Uh, so here's a bit of code. We've just got two imports. Ooh, too far. We've just got two imports. One is magic factory. Magic GUI comes with Napari, so you won't have seen that in your like install steps. Um, and then we import Napari, that's for later. Uh, and here you've got two things. You've got a magic factory decorator that we've just nicely placed above the function signature. And then you have a function signature like I was mentioning. So the name of the function is intensify. It takes two parameters. One is image layer and one is intensity delta. The image layer is type annotated with napari.layers.image. And that is the type of all images in Napari. And if you looked at like viewer.layers nuclei or whatever, you will have seen that it returns an image layer. And the intensity delta is just labeled with an int. So it's, it's, it's just an integer, nothing special about it, nothing Napari related about it. And then the return value is another Napari type, which is layer data tuple. And we'll see once we build this function, what that actually looks like. But that's all Magic Factory needs. Whatever goes on in this function, that's all Magic Factory needs to build a GUI for us. Uh, and because this image layer is annotated with napari.layers.image, it'll be like, ah, oh, you're trying to select an image layer. So it'll build a dropdown for you and it'll populate that dropdown with all of the image layers that are currently loaded into the viewer. Uh, and the integer is an integer, so it's like, okay, you're trying to select a number. So it's just going to build a spin box for you into which you can either type a number or go like plus minus to select a number. Um, and finally, the fact that you're returning a layered data tuple satisfies the rest of the contract with Napari and tells it that whatever you're returning out of this function will be added as a layer into the viewer. So you won't even need to add the layer yourself. Napari will do that just because you've told it that you're returning a layer data tuple. And so all that this function is gonna do is it's just going to add an integer to each pixel. Uh, so it's a very toy function, but you know, it does the job. All it does is it just makes things brighter. Um, and now we're going to build this layer data tuple. So the layer data tuple needs a layer type. And in this case, it's just image. It needs metadata, which could just be an empty dictionary. But in this case, we've provided uh, metadata that will be applied to the image. So one is the name, and the name is going to be intensified image. And one is the color map, which you've probably, you're probably used to selecting for the layer controls, but you can pass through uh, in code as well. And we're going to say that that's going to be magma just for the sake of it. And the final thing that you need in the layer tuple is, of course, the data, because without data, it wouldn't be much of an image. Uh, and so what we're returning here. Uh, is a tuple. It has three items in it, and those items are the data, the metadata, and the layer type. Uh, and that is, that is how you satisfy uh, the layer data tuple type, because it's just a tuple, tuple with three things, the data, the metadata, and the, the type of layer as a strip. And that's kind of all you need to turn this into a widget, but the next step is like, okay, Outside of plugins and, and packaging and whatever, how do I add this widget to an Apari viewer? So to make the widget, you just call the function with no parameters. You just call it. Uh, and that returns a widget to you that is actually also callable with the parameters that you've uh, displayed there. Uh, from in the plugin, that's abstracted, but you can actually build widgets independently of plugins. Uh, and so that's why I'm showing you the, this construct here. So once you've built your widget, you build a viewer the same way we've seen. You add the doc widget using viewer.window.add doc widget. Uh, and then because we're in a script, 
to start the Qt event loop, I've got an apari.run folder. You haven't seen that in your notebooks because in the interactive uh, Python console, the run is kind of, I mean, the Qt loop starts as soon as you create the viewer so that you can interact with it both ways, right? In a script, you can't do that. And that's where the napari.run comes in. So here's one I prepared earlier once I find my cursor. So this is the exact same code that we just saw. I've just copied it into a random Python script. Uh, there's nothing else really in this folder. Okay, it's not like a, it's like a, it's not a plugin or anything. It's just a Python script. Um, and when I run this, in theory, um, the viewer will open with my widget added over here, right? So it, you know, it's built labels for me and everything. At the moment, the dropdown is empty, but once I open an image, and we'll just open uh, any old image. So here's one of the sample images. As you can see, it's populated here. Uh, it's just got one thing. If I add a labels layer, that's not there because a labels layer is not an image layer, right? So only images are gonna be added. If I open a different image, uh, whatever, camera, that is there, okay? So again, that's all handled for you. You don't need to worry about it. If I delete the layers, again, it goes away. Uh, and then let's just say I put any integer in here. If I try to add a float, I can't. I can't put like 20.5 in there because that's all guarded by the fact that I type annotated it an int. Uh, and then let's just add, I don't know, 11. And when I click run, all it does is it makes the image brighter and returns it to you in magma color map. Um, okay, not super exciting, but I hope that you can see that it's named what we told it to be named. Is this big enough for that? Um, so it's named what we told it to be named. We told it to be named intensified image. And that is what it's called, the layer. Uh, and we told it to be color map magma, and it is indeed color map magma. Um, okay, so that is all that you need to build a widget. Type annotations and your magic factory decorator. Now, ooh, where am I going? There we are. Building a widget in a script is great, and you know, it gives you a lot of flexibility, but you want to put it into a plugin. Uh, and the glue between your widget just living in a Python file and Napari is napari.yaml, which is a config file. Um, and in that config file, you tell uh, Napari what your plugin can do. Uh, you tell it whether it can read things or write things or add widgets or provide sample data. And you tell it which functions in your code do what things. Uh, so let's take a look at what an example in the pari.yaml file might look like for this intensity widget that we just built. So the name is intensify, and actually this would be your PyPI, your pip package name if you had released it to pip, but if you haven't released it to pip, then um, it doesn't have to be. Um, and the display name is the name that you would see in the viewer. Uh, so when you go plugins and you've got all those plugins listed there, this display name can be something more descriptive and is less restrictive than the like pip package name, which has to be, you know, a bunch of dashes and in Python often just a bunch of like associated consonants that are, uh, you know, not pronounceable. But that's metadata that you need. And then it has contributions. So a command is, you know, gives your contribution a unique ID and it points to your function. So if I put my intensify uh, function in a module named intensify in a file named underscore widget, this is just a fully qualified path to that function. Uh, and then it has a title uh, that you could use to search in a command palette or whatever. And so once you've told it that, hey, this is where you can find the function to run, um, you also add a widget contribution. Uh, and now for widgets, all that is is the exact same command ID as you typed up here, but also a display name uh, so that it's like, you know, human readable uh, in the viewer. 
this might seem kind of pointless, like why am I defining it twice? Um, I'm afraid I don't have a satisfying reason for you uh, that wouldn't involve us looking at readers and writers as well, but for readers and writers and for sample data, you actually provide more useful metadata over here in the contribution. Like for readers, uh, you can filter what file types um, and what file extensions you accept and stuff like that. But we won't cover that today. Come up to me, obviously, uh, anytime and ask me if you want to learn more and I will show you what the cookie cutter builds for you. Um, but this is all you would need in napari.yaml to make our Intensify widget a plugin. Uh, but there's a bit more because, okay, now you've got napari.yaml and it's a config file. But how does Napari find this config file, right? That tells you where your functions are. Um, and so the way that works is Napari checks all of the installed packages in your Python environment to find things that advertise themselves as plugins. Um, and a package makes itself discoverable to Napari by declaring an entry point in the package configuration file. If this sounds like gibberish, that's fine. Um, we'll see, you know, I'll show you in the cookie cutter template what, how all of that ties together. Um, but this entry point that you write in your configuration file, or if you've used the cookie cutter you look at in your configuration file, um, points to napari.yaml. So the package config points to napari.yaml, napari.yaml points to your Python functions, and that is the, the connection between just like a random old package that's installed in your environment and the Napari viewer. Uh, and so in setup.cfg, which is your package configuration file, you will see uh, this exact code basically, except that instead of intensify, it'll potentially say other things. Um, and as you can see, it directly points to the napari.yaml config file. And so speaking of packaging, um, what is a Python package? Uh, what does that look like uh, in real terms? Minimally, it kind of looks like this. Okay, so in uh, home, you have a directory, uh, and inside that directory, you've got pyproject.toml and setup.cfg, and these two files tell the world and tell pip that this is a Python package, not just any old folder of like dog images or anything like that. Uh, and inside that, you've got a module which has an init.py file, which could be blank, and your napari.yaml. Okay, so minimally, this is what a Python package could be. And the benefit of having a package rather than just any old folder is that you can release that package and so make your plugin pip installable, right? So like, you know, you've probably pip installed a fair few things uh, by now. This is one way to configure your package to be pip installable and allows you to distribute it. Right, and potentially have it on the Napari hub uh, and configure other you know, different options like author metadata and GitHub repository where you can find your package and, and all of that stuff. But you don't need to know any of that actually. Um, so maybe you took the opportunity to catch a nap during these last like 20 minutes or whatever um, because the cookie cutter does all of that for you. Okay, so it's useful to know how all the things connect together but you don't have to go ahead and write your own napari.yaml or your own setup.cfg or whatever. Uh, so the cookie cutter generates an example plugin for you. And it comes, apart from being pre-configured with code that runs as a plugin that you can edit to do your own nefarious things or non-nefarious things. Um, it also has a lot of utilities for testing. So it has example tests um, that you, know, you can run to make sure your plugin does the things you want it to do packaging, deploying your plugin to PyPI. Uh, so deploying is the step of getting it from your like local machine in, you know, into the cloud. Um, so available on PyPI. Uh, and it also has configuration options for the Napari hub. So as we saw earlier, the Napari hub is where all of the Napari plugins can be found and you can you know, customize the way your plugin looks on the Napari hub, uh, all with stuff that comes with the so let's see uh, what it looks like to you know, use the cookie cutter uh, to build a plugin. I'm just gonna close down the notebooks. We don't need them anymore. And I'm gonna Okay. 
So just to show you that I'm not like hiding anything behind the scenes, all we have in this folder right here is that in little intensify widget um, that I was playing with before, there's nothing else. Uh, and to start the cookie cutter, uh, I went, uh, and this is all in your instruction notebook, um, but this is the cookie cutter GitHub, and it might look a bit intimidating, but all you actually need to do is just copy over this little bit uh, and just paste it here. Uh, and that's going to download the little cookie cutter template, and then it's going to ask you some questions. Um, and so I'm just going to fill in some of these, but a lot of them I'll leave uh, default just because I'm not planning to release this anywhere. Um, I can make it a little bit bigger for you. Ooh. Is that better? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it asks your email. It asks your GitHub username. If you're going to actually host this on GitHub, um, you can just leave it all blank if you want. It asks for your plugin name, and this is going to be the PyPI name. Uh, and I'm just going to call mine Intensify, um, but you can call yours something meaningful. Um, I'm not actually going to put this on GitHub, so I'm just going to not provide a GitHub URL. I'm happy with Intensify as the module name in general. I mean, I don't know, you can call your modules whatever you want, but defaults for most of these are, are perfectly satisfactory. The display name, I'm not going to call that. Uh, because that's not very descriptive. And I'm going to call it image intensification. And in fact, like, I know that our uh, cookie cutter gave it the uh, Napari prefix. You don't have to do that. Uh, so ideally, you wouldn't do that. Don't, don't use Napari in your, in your package names, um, basically, because it makes it kind of hard to, to browse the Napari hub. But anyway, that's a pet peeve of mine. So, <laughs> so the display name is just image intensification. Uh, I'm not going to change this short description, but you know, if you're planning to actually release this, you probably should. And then we get to the good stuff. So now it's asking us what example plugin types you want to include. I'm going to say yes to pretty much everything, just so I can show you what that looks like in the cookie cutter. But the only one that we really like care about today specifically is the widget, uh, right? Because what we're going to be building is a widget. Um, these are kind of like in-depth things, but if you want to use Git tab, if, you, if you're going to release this plugin, you might want to use Git tags for versioning just because it um, lowers the burden on you. But I'm going to say no to these. These are all, by the way, if you're like lost and not sure why you're being asked these things, it's all like pretty well defined uh, in, in the readme. So as in like what you can do with each of the options and then and, and what their point is. It asks for the license. Uh, these are all um, open source licenses, uh, I'm pretty sure. We strongly encourage you to release your plugins as open source. But once I click enter, hit enter rather, um, it creates the plugin for me. And it gives me a bunch of instructions, which again, I suggest you read these instructions, but I've read them a couple of times now. So I'm just going to show you what it built. Um, so as you can see now in this, um, in this folder, we have a new folder called Intensify. Uh, and I'm going to CD into that folder and open it up in VS Code. Yeah. Uh, so just LSing. Ooh. So we were here inside the plugins directory. And if I ls, we've got that original file that I just had in there, but we've now got a folder called Intensify because that's what I called my plugin. And I'm going to cd into there, and I'm going to open it up in code. In VS Code, that is, just because it's easier to browse. Um, so this all comes with your cookie cutter template. Much of it you probably will never touch, uh, but I will you know, do a little sightseeing tour uh, around what you've got here. So you've got setup.cfg and pyproject.toml, which you might remember from my um, rambling earlier before. But if I open setup.cfg, what I want to show you is apart from a description and a name and your author and stuff like that, which is pre-populated, you have the snippet of code here. So it tells you that you can find the package in SRC, and lo and behold, there is an SRC folder right there. 
uh, and it tells you that the entry point for the Napari plugin is intensifynapari.yaml. And so if I look in SRC and then I look in the uh, intensify folder, there is my napari.yaml. So it's all connected. Um, and once I open napari.yaml, you're going to scream because, oh my God, there's so much in here. But um, there's only a couple of things I guess I want to point out. One is we have widget contributions, right, with commands and display names, just as I um, sort of mentioned before. And then you can see it's already come like pre-configured with all of the um, writer commands and reader commands because I selected that, right? Because I said, yes, give me a reader, give me a writer, give me a sample. Um, it comes pre-populated with all of this. And so let's take a look at one of the widgets, for example. Let's take a look at this one. Uh, its name is make magic widget, fine. But the Python name is intensify underscore widget example magic widget. So I can use this, I can go into intensify widget. And then in here, I should be able to find a thing called example magic widget, and there it is. Okay, and it's just a magic factory decorated function like we saw before. And uh, you don't have to be too sharp to notice that there's other things in this file. Uh, and those are the other two ways of defining widgets that I was talking about before. And the only one that I'm going to kind of briefly mention here is this example queue widget. So if you're trying to build super complex plugins, if you're trying to build like big things that require you to pop dialogues and close dialogues and, you know, add tabs and, and I don't know, do all sorts of like weird and wonderful things, you can use the full might of PyQt uh, by subclassing queue widget. The downside of that is that, as you can see, you have to like build your own buttons and make a layout for your GUI and add the button and add callbacks for the button, right? So all of the stuff that was being done for you in the background with the magic GUI widget, you have to do yourself if you're subclassing Q widget, but it gives you more flexibility, right? I mean, if you are like a GUI guru, um, yeah, I just came up with that one. It's not bad, right? Um, then, then you have full control, right? So you don't have, you, you're not stuck in this like magic GUI box. You can do whatever you want. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna delete everything in here <laughs> and I'm gonna replace it uh, with my uh, intensify widget, which I will find over here. So I'm just gonna copy the widget uh, in here. And then I think the only thing we'll need to do is import magic factory as well. I'm just going to copy that import statement as well. Okay, and so now that I've changed the name of this, you know, function that was in here, I'm going to go into napari.yaml and I'm going to delete the things that talk about example queue widgets and the things that talk about function widgets because I deleted that code, right? I just replaced it with my own. Uh, and the only thing I'm going to do for the magic widget is instead of pointing it to example magic widget, I'm just going to point it to intensify, which is the name of our function in here. And I'm going to save that and I'm going to save this. Uh, VS Code is complaining because I haven't selected my um, environment and that should stop now. Yeah. Um, so that's all that's in the widget file. And in napari.yaml, I've kept just the command for that one widget. And I've pointed it to the new function that we wrote. And because I deleted the command, I'm going to delete these contributions here as well. And I'm going to rename the magic widget to intensify image. Um, yeah. So. I made the changes to the widget file. I made the change to napari.yaml. And then the final thing, and this might catch you out because it always catches me out, uh, the functions are often imported in the init. Uh, and so because they no longer exist, you probably don't want to import them. So I'm just deleting uh, references to things that no longer exist. You don't have to do this, by the way. I mean, you can just keep all those widgets there and add your widget to the bottom. Um, but, you know, I'm just, I guess, trying to show you where are the different bits that you might want to change in your plugin. Um, 
And just before I run this uh, to increase the suspense, uh, I want to show you these other files. So these files were built for us by the cookie cutter, right? We haven't touched them. Uh, but the cool thing about them is they're not just like empty files. They're actually like fully documented, descriptive examples of real readers or real writers or real, real sample data uh, plugins. So if you're the kind of person who learns by doing, you can just look at these files and start tweaking things uh, and see what, you know, see how that changes your plugin functionality rather than building something from scratch. But now that I have changed all of this, I should be ready to uh, install my plugin. And the way I do that is with pip install dash e dot. So dash e makes it editable. So if I make changes to the code, I don't have to reinstall the plugin to see those uh, changes become active. And I'm doing that. I, I shouldn't need to because in theory my code's perfect, but you know, let's assume I made an error somewhere. Uh, and then the dot just refers to the current directory. Uh, so because we are in the directory where the plugin code lives, and I'm just going to show you that again. See, so in this directory, we have our private project toml uh, setup.cfg. We can just point it to this directory. Good. So in theory, that works. Um, and it does the installation. And once it has, I should be able to launch Napari. And look inside the plugins menu and find my intensify uh, plugin. And when I click on that, it errors. Because I forgot to, I thought I changed that. Did I forget to save it? Oh yeah, I didn't change it. Oops. Yeah, so just to go back, um, it's complaining because it said failed to import command, intensify, intensify. Cannot import name, example, magic widget from intensify.widget. Uh, and that's accurate because if we go into the uh, widget function, there's no such thing called example magic widget. So all that I did here in, in it is I forgot to make uh, the change to what our function is actually called. I did that on purpose to show you. Um, now, because uh, we installed an editable mode, let me just close down uh, this window. Because I installed an editable mode, I should be able to just relaunch Napari without reinstalling. Uh, the plugin and that change should have taken effect assuming I saved the file. Yeah, so that builds the same widget that we saw before, but now from a plugin rather than just from a Python script. Uh, and if we open up a sample, let's just do the clock again. Oh, yeah, you can see also the sample data that was provided uh, by our cookie cutter, right? So you can see that sample data file there, um, and that's also available to you to play with straight away. So you can just pip install a like naked cookie cutter plugin um, and you'll see everything in the viewer and you'll be able to play with it. But for now, let's just open a clock. And that's been pre-populated there. So all is working as expected. And if I just give it a number and run, it adds the layer uh, and it does the thing, right? So now our, uh, Intensify widget is a full-fledged plugin with a reader and sample data and so on. Uh, and that would be ready to release to PyPI if, if we wanted it up there, but maybe, maybe not. So now it's a you do bit. Uh, and if you go into your notebooks, there is a, a where is this actually? The make a sample plugin. Oh yeah, it's on the website. Do I have that loaded anywhere? Uh, so here on the website, if you go to creating an Apari plugin, it will walk you through uh, pretty much most of the things that I just talked about, but for your detect spots function, uh, so that your plugin can detect spots in images. Any questions before we hit the road on that? Cool. Oh, yeah. Yep. You could, yeah, so if you wanted to write a custom data loader, uh, where you would go in your cookie cutter plugin uh, is to this reader file. Now this one here, 
uh, reads NumPy files uh, into NumPy arrays. So potentially it's not super exciting. Um, but this is where you would start editing the code to make a custom loader for different, um, for different data files and different file formats. Any other questions? Yeah? Uh, Stardust actually use Magic GUI. Um, yeah, so start, So the question was, what do Stardust use to build their GUI? Um, and they're actually directly subclassing Magic GUI as well. And so, you know, that plugin was pretty complex, but it's not so complex that Magic GUI can't handle it. Uh, so it's really kind of a, you know, developer's choice as to whether you go the full-fledged QWidget route or whether you just decide to use Magic GUI. Um, it's really easy to spin up Magic GUI widgets though, as we've seen. And so often when you're just playing around with things, that will be, uh, that'll be the way to go. Yep. So from a, from a like philosophical, well, not just philosophical, Anything that can be loaded into Python as a NumPy-like array can also be loaded into an Apari. Uh, and so that's not just NumPy-like arrays. It can be a Dask array or uh, like a, a, a za array loaded from file. Any of that it can be loaded into an Apari. The, what the readers do is given like a, a specific file format, bring it into Python. Right, so if you can bring it into Python, you can bring it into Napari, more or less. There's definitely caveats there, but but as as a rule, that's that's the the um, the requirement is that it be a NumPy like array that supports uh, NumPy like slicing and indexing. That's a good question. How big can the data be that you load into Napari? The if it's two, if, if you're rendering in 2D and you are backed by um, a lazy uh, data type, so like a Dask array, which if you just drag and drop something into Napari, you will be backed by a Dask array, um, then it can be as big as you want. It doesn't have to be in, in memory um, because the fact that it's backed by a lazy data structure means we only load the specific bit that you're looking at. Volumes, at the moment, we don't yet have like async um, like loading for. And so what that means is that if you want to view it in 3D, you are limited um, by, by the amount of RAM on your computer for now. Um, and that won't stay that way for long, <laughs> basically. But that's, uh, yeah, so for now, 3D rendering is limited by the amount of RAM that you have available to you. But if you're loading in 2D, um, and you're backed by a lazy array, it can be as big as you want. Of course, though, if it's like remote data uh, or if your like chunks are really big or your, you know, your slices are really big, um, performance could be an issue. And if you just have one giant 2D image that is like 150 gigabytes, that would also uh, cause trouble. Going a bit more into depth on that, I guess, if you have um, multi-scale images, so if you have pyramids of like successively lower resolutions, we support that. So even if your single slice is really, really big, if you've downsampled it, that also like, you know, yeah, is a way to, to sort of get around the data issue. But longer term, and by longer term, I mean in the next sort of maybe year or so, we should be able to load anything from anywhere. Uh, regardless of the size, because we're looking to implement async loading um, so that so that you really only load the thing that is currently uh, on screen. Yeah. Yeah, the theory is good. Um, yeah, any more questions? Obviously, uh, come up to us, put your hands up, but we'll kick off with the rest of it. Oh, yeah. What's my favorite plugin? Uh, Natari. Okay, that's not a serious answer. 
<laughs> but it is, well, no, it's kind of my favorite plugin just because, um, actually, maybe I can just, uh, because I just think it's really neat. Um, so what it is, ooh, I probably should just go on random. And I'll show you because he usually has GIFs. Um, yeah, so you can play like little games uh, in the viewer. So one, <laughs> so one of them is like a slider puzzle. Um, and then there's like brick breaker. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, this isn't my most useful plugin maybe, but it's definitely the cutest. And I think, you know, I think one of the reasons I really love it is because it just exemplifies how like playful and, and well, I think fun the community is. Um, and yeah, we, we love seeing sort of, you know, cute stuff like this. So if you, you know, if you wanna, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, enough about Natari, I suppose. Uh, let's build serious plugins that detect spot. Yeah, well, yeah, they are, right? Yeah. Blast them. Yeah. <laughs> and there's, yeah, Snake as well. I mean, it's, pre it's pretty cute. Uh, and, you know, it kind of showcases um, the many weird and wonderful things you can do 